still struggling trying to find good talent for your practice, just going in circles with staff turnover and having to do all the work yourself at the end of the day. Well, I'm joined today with Dr. Gary Rademacher, who has built multiple staff driven practices and is going to help today talk about what it takes to manage, hire good talent and build leaders in practice so you can be in there or not be in there and have your practice go at the same time. My name is Ethan Damer with the Business Academy and Dr. Gary Rademacher. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So my first question for you is, my gosh, how do you attract the right talent or do you develop it in your office or is it a combination of both? You've had to do that over the years to build this, this juggernaut of a team that just manages this, this seven figure practice and all your, you know, your satellites without you having to even be there. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, when, when you're, when you're looking for someone, people, I've seen different studies now that it's like, it used to be one in 20 are hireable, mm -hmm. one in 50, one in a hundred. I mean, it seems like the talent pool is getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so the way I look at it is like, you always hire for attitude. You know, I'm always looking for that good attitude and someone who is lined up with, you know, my purpose um, and everything else. Like, you know, you can train on anything. You can't train on heart. So, you know, it's like you hire for attitude first and everything else is trainable. Gotcha. So even if they're, they can do a job well in your practice, they're a great biller and they have great billing experience or they're got CA experience or they're a real high talent when it comes to closing. Uh, but you're, you're looking for attitude first. And that is what I know having seen and worked with your team. That's what drives that business is yep. the attitude of the group. It's a no excuses attitude. It's on purpose. Everyone wants to grow and expand themselves as well as the practice. Um, talk about the structure of your business. So not only are you fully staffed in all of your practices, uh, but you have like a leadership structure that allows for your staff to have what they need, but also to have a, a, a well-balanced leadership team who has training skills to help grow your team. Talk about how that looks in your practice if I were to take a glance at your org chart. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, to me, you you hire and, and train from the top down, right? Mm -hmm. So it's um, as the as the business, you know, owner, you have to be well-trained. Yeah. So, you know, it was having that relationship with the Business Academy and uh, training myself up and once I was trained up, then I could start bringing people in to different positions of leadership from, you know, uh, if you look at the different divisions and organization, it was, you know, having that uh, front desk lead person who ran the front desk. It was having a case manager lead. It was having someone in the billing department who led that area. Um, it was uh, someone uh, who uh, was lead over the production area, all the treatment, all the services we do. Um, it, it was having a, a marketing lead. And so we literally created leadership tiers. Uh, but then as you grow and expand, you know, uh, for, for me, I had to create another layer of management from an operational director or a clinical director, a sales director, an executive director, you know, for me to push myself up and out for my staff to know, like, I wanted to be out of the organization, they had to replace me. So they had to push me up and out. So eventually it was hiring that executive director who took over the the show, so to speak. So um, it's a it's a much bigger behemoth to do something like that. But if you want freedom, which this is what this is about, yeah. um, if you want true freedom to do whatever it is that you want to do, uh, you have to have management structured in your organization to handle the things that you normally would do. I think one thing you said, it's really worth noting uh, to those that are watching is you hired from the top down. That might be kind of a throwaway uh, statement for some watching this, but it's so important. I think one big mistake that I find is that for most doctors, whether they're an integrated practice with multiple service set service centers or their chiropractic office with a couple service centers, is they hire for help to do a job, yeah. but then next they keep growing and expanding, and next thing you know, you have 11 staff and one manager who is you as the doctor. Yeah. And, um, and you're just hiring technicians in the organization. And as a result, I mean, my gosh, how exhausting is it to have 11 staff all coming to you to put out their fires and you have to do half their work anyway. Um, but instead you did something unique in that you flipped the script. You would hire people to be in a lead role, to be in a manager role, and then they would do the work beneath them, but also manage that division, manage the fires and manage that area. And then as you expand and put people underneath them, 
you did it in a hierarchy that was in an organized manner based on um, an organizing board or an org chart that you've had since like the very beginning. Talk about that what that process was of with the Business Academy early on in practice when you were putting an organizing board together. Maybe you didn't have 30 staff, maybe you had four staff or five staff. Why was that so important to structure out visually for your team to help you scale uh, into the future? Yeah, um, great question. Um, the organizing board, I, I tell you, the, the taking the courses through the Business Academy, teaching you how to be an executive, um, teaching you the, 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 the ins and outs of running a business are critical to success. And an organizing board, when I took that course, it took me multiple trips to wrap my head around that and create an organizing board for my office. But what it did was it gave a roadmap, a picture, a map of what all the different departments were, divisions were, who was in those divisions, what the communication lines were, what the command lines were, who was in charge of what area. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a something that a staff member can visualize and it answers so many questions for them if they're trained up on that. Like our new staff are trained up on the org board. They understand who they go to for certain situations so that they're not creating extra work for someone. Like for instance, the if you know, I always do this with doctors a lot of times when I'm first meeting with them and they're deciding, do I want to be a, with the business academy or not? Right. And um, you know, I'll ask them questions like, well, do you ever answer the phone? Do you hire? You know, do you um, uh, do you ever do anything in the billing department? Do you do your day ones and day twos? Do you? Uh, and so I answer, I ask some questions that, along every single division of the organization. And I would say a hundred percent of the time, that doctor is in at least four out of the seven divisions and handling fires in the other three, yes. four divisions, right? Yeah. And to the degree that you push yourself up and out of these divisions dictates how many people you can serve, how big you get. And I, I, and I think a big misconception that chiropractors have is they're told, at least I was told, when you get out of school, you start on the shoestring and keep your overhead really low. And that's great, but if you continue to model yourself off of that data, you'll never grow. Right. You'll, you'll, your ceiling is really low. It's not really a ceiling. It's a floor. Right. You know, and um, I would rather make 20%, you know, of a $10 million business than 40% of a million dollar business. And so people get lost in like whether an overhead's too high. It's not overhead. It's not how much you spend. It's on what's your gross income which is all your gross income is basically and into your profit margins. How many people are you serving? You know, yeah, income is king. And that comes down to servicing, service, service, service. You help in serve as many people as possible, but you can only do that with a good team. Yep. And since we're talking about your team, your team has to be vested in your organization. Right. You know, and so if you're always looking for bottom dwellers to fill a role and, and pay minimum wage, that's what you're going to get. Right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. It's funny in the beginning in practice for those new grads or those that are about to, about to graduate that are watching this series with you, uh, in the beginning, you have tons of time and no money. Yep. And so you have to go out there and, and use your time, personal time to generate revenue. But I mean, it's not how, if you had that mindset for 30 years in practice, then you're going to quickly run out of time and maybe you have income, but you're not going to have any time, and then you're going to be you're going to be borrowing time from important things like family or or things that make you happy, and that's going to become your life in practice. Versus what you're talking about is yeah, in the beginning you have lots of time and no money, but once you start generating money and income, start to invest in other people's time and put that into other people's time to help grow the practice, so you're not the slave to time, right? Yeah. And and the slave to your own practice. And this is really what the mentality of managing a business with with your practice as part of the Business Academy is all about, building practice freedom so you can do what you wanna do. And again, for some, you've talked to so many hundreds of uh, doctors over the years, some just want that extra time and flexibility to be with family. Some want it to grow their empire. Some wanna do it to find more revenue opportunities. Others wanna do it to serve their community more and have 20 practices. 
Um, everyone's reason is different. Uh, or maybe just to be able to work three days a week yeah. and just enjoy life. You know, that's another motivation for some chiropractors. Whatever it is, the mechanics of how to get there don't change. The laws and systems don't change. You have to build a staff-driven practice, not a personality-based practice. Yeah. So uh, when you manage your, and I wouldn't say you, when your team manages using your system of management in the office of the Business Academy, they're driving, they're, they're working with those, those staff driving performance and production, right? So I know a big thing in your office is you've implemented management by statistics mm -hmm. over the years very thoroughly alongside with a good org chart with well-defined roles and, and leaders and managers. Talk to us about how you, you know, uh, how do you, how does your team get managed by statistics? How are they rewarded uh, for higher performance? And then, you know, how do you do training and, and correction when performance is lower? Sure. Um, that was an, an amazing course, Managed by Statistics. I mean, that was when the light bulb started turning on for me years ago. Um, but basically, every position in an organization has what I'd call a valuable final product. You hired them to, uh, do a job. Mm -hmm. um, it's valuable, means it's exchangeable. You're paying them to do this job for you. So you're buying time in yeah. essence, right? And um, they all have like quotas, you know, you know, and they have targets. And so, um, you know, we, we pay our staff on a base, but they also get bonus based on hitting those targets. And that's by monitoring statistics on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And so, um, you know, everyone in our organization knows that mm -hmm. they're driven on that. Mm -hmm. If they're hitting targets, it's great. If they're not hitting targets, there's more communication on why not. Yeah. Like, well, what, what are you running into? And so management really is like, well, I like to, you know, we, we call it, uh, you know, product officering, right? You know, so when managers go into areas of the organization, they're looking at the staff members' uh, quota graph. Where are they at? Are they up, down? Are they above that quota, below quota? Mm -hmm. If they're above quota and they uh, look at their desk in their area and they're winning, it's a high five and they move on. Like they just say, hey, job well done, move on uh, to the next person. When they go to another person, if they're below quota, if they got a messy desk, if they got stuff just piling up, might spend more time in that area. Like, what are you running into? And you offer a help flow. Right. You know, so all your management comes down to managing by statistics, you know. Um, and this allows you to even manage your business remotely as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, your your practices are in Colorado. We're filming today. Let's see, it's a Wednesday. We're in Florida, right? Your businesses are in practices are running without you there. But you can always check in with yeah. the data analytics and the statistics of the office to see uh, how well they are managing in relationship to each other and how well they're doing there and if they're on par for quarterly, monthly, weekly, and, and, and daily targets that you've set. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And then your staff are also, I mean, they have compensation and bonus structures in place when they exceed goals. Um, uh, I know obviously it's, it's position dependent, but that's a big part of your business too, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously the more responsibility you have, the, the higher um, the pay you get and the um, higher the opportunity is for, you know, bigger bonuses. Um, and, um, you know, when you start playing really big games with, you know, multiple offices, you know, you're, you're playing the whole, you know, being vested, the partnership games with people. I mean, people who are just like key players in your organization, you know, you don't want to lose them. Yep. And so, you know, someone who is going to work and they have, and they're invested in that organization, they own a piece of it, are going to work a hell of a lot harder for the organization than they would if they didn't have that. Right. right, that makes total sense. And then a lot of your current managers and leaders that run parts of your practice were not hired as managers, they were hired as team members that grew into yeah. what they are now. Yeah. That's a big part of what you invest a lot in your staff yeah. and in growth, that kind of stuff too. There's always opportunity, especially when you're looking at doing multiple offices, like um, some of our, our, the, our top staff, you know, my executive director started off as a case manager. My uh, operational director started off as a front desk person. And, um, you know, when you know what someone's personal, professional, financial goals are, and they know yours, and they're helping you detain yours, you want to help them as well. And so uh, there is, a, when you are constantly putting in the tools that, that the Business Academy teaches, you literally will continue to expand. 
And if you're going to continually expand, you need to develop people. So that front desk person you have, they probably don't want to be your front desk forever. You know, they want to maybe become the lead of that area. Then they want to get into some a management position. So people want to know they have the opportunity to grow and expand. And, um, you know, this is where if you're not growing and expanding, uh, it's, it's hard to find someone who's going to stick for a long time if they're not actually growing and expanding. Right. And do you want someone in your organization that doesn't want to grow and expand? You, I mean, there's you want A players in your organization. Yeah. And that you have to attract those people too yeah. and train them and develop them. Talk about how you train, or not you, how your staff, I should say your leaders, how they train and develop the staff. How often are you guys training? Uh, how often are you investing with outside training for your staff? How, how often is this process occurring? How often then are you expecting them to develop on, develop themselves? Well, I mean, uh, it depends on the position. Uh, you know, in the office, though, we train daily. Mm -hmm. So there's always time in the day for training. Yep. Um, example, if it's a case manager, they're always training on scripts, yep. role playing. They're training on objection handles. Um, they're training at how to increase the awareness of someone to, to bring the value up in what we do so that, you know, when value supersedes money, money is not a, an objection, right. which is used 80% of the time to get out of the area, you know, uh, when they can afford it. Yep. Um, but every position trains daily. Managers uh, do a lot of business academy training. So a lot of the, you know, the executive courses, I mean, your managers have to know what you know. And if what you know is because you took management courses, why not have them take the same courses? Of course. So you can speak the same language, right? Um, and um, and then, you know, we're always looking for, you know, special trainings that are going on throughout the country on what can enhance their skill set, specifically for like your executive level, you know, players. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, and then uh, talk a bit about um, when you were transitioning from hands-on managing your business, hands-on managing your staff, hands-on managing the processes of the office. Uh, maybe you were out of treating, but you were still day-to-day -day in the office putting out fires um, and handling the management of the office. Letting go of that to a leader, you know, what were some of the things that you had to keep in mind in passing that role and that hat so you could be fully out of the office yeah. at your choosing? Yeah, I think that the biggest issue that I had to deal with was uh, not to bypass my managers, meaning that if staff were coming to me still and I was answering those questions for them, it created problems. So I mean, when your employees go, well, he's the one who signs my checks, so I better go to him, even though I have a manager in between us. So that can cause a problem. Yeah. The, 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 the best thing that I really wrapped my head around was, hey, that's a great question. You need to go see, you know, and I'll redirect. Where I would actually take them to the org board, the organizing board, and say, okay, what's your question? Great, let's look at this organizing. Okay, who on this board handles that? Right. And it's just an education time. Right. You know, um, the more that your managers can do that and an owner can do that to direct the staff person to the right person, you know, the speed of particle flow dictates how big you can get. That's right. So the faster they get their questions answered by going to the right person, the better, the more success you're going to have. Right. If they're going to the wrong person, First is they're wasting time, but then that person who they went to now has to stop what they're doing and answer the question and redirect. So it slows the organization down. Of course. So uh, a key thing that and we train on this is speed of particle flow. It's the, the speed of file, the speed of communication. The faster those cycles happen, the more people you can serve. That's right. That makes sense. So then also it's you can't notice something in your business and go and, and jump over your managers to correct staff either because that's going to create disruption in your management team too, right? So you have to not only train your managers, invest in them, develop them, but then do you have regular like executive meetings with your managers on a routine basis? So yeah, before I answer that, one other thing on that last point is if I do have a communication with someone, I always let their manager know about right. it. So I, it's not like I stop communication completely. It's just that if I have to help something, I have to bring in that manager and let them know what occurred so that they're not being bypassed. So that they're in the know all the time of what's going on. Makes total sense. Yeah. Now, um, what was your last question? So how do you, do you run uh, weekly or monthly meetings with your executive team? How do you manage that relationship to ensure they're on track with your vision and, and moving the practice forward? Yeah, we have a, so, so there's a morning huddle up every morning before every shift. 
um, with just the, the the general staff and and some of the managers. Um, there's a weekly meeting with everyone. Uh, you know, for the multiple offices, we do we'll bring in Zoom, yep. and we'll you know, we'll have two couple different conference rooms where everyone can see each other, and we have we'll conduct a meeting once a week, and then we do quarterly management meetings to set the. Uh, what we I'd call like the admin scale. Like what, what what are our targets for this quarter? What are our yearly targets? Let's break it down to quarterly targets. How are we doing with those? And uh, you know we we sit and we battle plan for a couple of days. Sure, that's great. And then uh, gamification is big in your office. So constantly playing games with your staff, having big rewards, team outings, having big goals as a group, and then and then as a team going out and celebrating together. That's a big part of the culture of your company, right? Yeah, I mean, you want to have fun. Yeah, I mean, it's and so it's a uh, you know whether it's a barbecue or we're playing a game for um, you know, going bowling or to you know top golf or there's always something going on where we're trying to attain a certain target as a group where it's a group win. Yeah. Um, uh, and then we also have divisional targets and games going on. So um, everyone's usually you know you know playing for something. That's awesome. So I would imagine when you're building this these this management system inside your practice that allows you to be away from your practice while it's being run and managed and succeeding. I mean, I know you're a smart guy, but I know you didn't just come up with it one day and just put it in place. So what was your involvement with the Business Academy to to learn and then to implement these systems to get to what we call phase two, which is the office running with or without you there and expanding and growing? Um, what was your involvement with the Business Academy to to learn that and implement those systems. Yeah. You know, I've, you know, been with the Business Academy for a long time. Uh, before that, I was with a lot of different practice management groups, a lot of them. And I always got something from them. Um, I always learned something. But when I joined the Business Academy, when they taught me how to run a business, how to be an executive, um, that's when I scaled and was able to like really grow and um, and be able to help more people. But it was jumping in. It was swimming in the Kool-Aid of the Business Academy. Right. Took, took all the courses. I went to every single workshop. Um, I, um, uh, you know, I, in retrospect, I wish I had taken the courses faster. You know, I mean, I, I spread it out over some time, uh, you know, but uh, the, the cl clients who get the best results are the ones who jump in and just take all the courses and they go back home and they implement. Right. So you have to get the beingness down first. And the beingness comes from studying, like becoming someone, like having the beingness of being an executive. And then the whole do, you go back to your office and you do the work necessary, you know, and having that commitment to actually following through and putting in what you've learned. And then you'll have the office that you want. That's right. I love it. Well, Dr. Rademacher, I think from these last few interviews and from this one as well, just by putting in 10% or 20% of what you've talked about for anybody watching is going to allow them to get some just some more freedom to get home before the sun goes down, right? To have an extra day on the weekend with their family. Uh, and then, of course, by committing to the processes that the Business Academy does and teaches and that you've implemented yourself will actually put them on the road to practice freedom. So I want to thank you for your time um and for joining us and for sharing your successful actions and best practices and i hope everyone watching these can put them into practice themselves and uh you know always contact the business academy if you want assistance or help to learn more and to help you get on the road to practice freedom dr rademacher thank you for your time Thank thanks you. for joining us